And now I would like to show you that the concept of an ideal clock turns out to be inconsistent with the basic laws of the quantum theory, which means that the ideal clocks simply cannot exist. Hello and welcome to the fifth episode of my online course on special relativity. My name is Andrzej Dragan. I'm a professor of theoretical physics at University of Warsaw and National University of Singapore. And today we will discuss some highly non-orthodox problems, ones that are skipped in most relativity textbooks. I will discuss why ideal clocks cannot exist. I will talk about relativity of extra dimensions. And also I will discuss the problem that I announced in the previous episode, namely why Elvis still lives. Well, at least according to special relativity. But we will kick things off with a well-known problem of the twin paradox, although we will approach it from a slightly unusual perspective. In the standard formulation, it goes roughly like this. Suppose that there are two twins, Alice and Bob. And Alice is standing still while Bob decides to go for a space trip. So he goes to the space station, enters a rocket, and starts to move around the universe, and after he's bored, he goes back. So, according to Alice, when they meet, Bob should be younger, because he was traveling all the time, and therefore he had to undergo the time dilation. The paradox begins with the question, what happens from the point of view of Bob? Because according to him, he was standing still all the trip, at least relative to himself. But it was Alice that was moving. And if she was moving, it's her that has to undergo the time dilation. So according to Bob, when they meet again, it is Alice that should be younger. And there we have a paradox, because they cannot be both right. When they meet, it has to be either Alice or Bob that is younger. So the standard solution of the paradox is to notice that there is no symmetry between those two points of view. Because Alice was an inertial observer, and Bob was not. Notice that Bob had to travel around, so he had to accelerate during the trip. And those accelerations make his frame of reference non-inertial. And none of the stuff we discussed so far applies to non-inertial frames of reference. So in this whole story, Alice was right and Bob was not. So this is how the story is explained in the usual textbook style. But it turns out that there is still plenty of stuff that we missed out. <laughs> So in order to properly discuss the twin paradox, we have to understand well what happens to moving clocks. So suppose that we have a moving clock that moves with some velocity v and measures time delta tau. And while it happens, another resting clock measures some other time delta t. And we have already established what is the relation between those clock rates. They are related via Lorentz factor. And if the time that is being measured is infinitesimally small, then we can simply replace the delta symbols with differentiation symbols, d. And now we can integrate both sides of the equation that results in the following formula. In that formula, we have the velocity v that characterizes the moving clock, that in principle could vary in time. So let us explicitly write it down. So we can now see something interesting in the formula. Notice that the integral that we have obtained is actually proportional to a relativistic invariant, the space-time interval between two infinitesimally close events. And since we are integrating something that is invariant, the whole integral is also an invariant, which means that it has to be the same for all inertial observers. So that new quantity that we have defined, tau, is usually called proper time. And its being variant means that if we consider a inertial observer that observes a moving clock that moves between two points, call them A and B, connected by the trajectory of the moving clock, then the proper time along that trajectory, which is the time measured by the moving clock, has a very important property. If we consider a completely different observer that watches the same moving clock between those same events, 
then although the trajectory has a completely different shape, the proper time along that new trajectory is still the same. It equals tau. And that's what we mean by saying that the proper time is a relativistic invariant. <laughs> So normally when somebody discusses the twin paradox, it is typical to only take the point of view of the inertial frame of reference, inertial twin. Because the other guy accelerates and it's difficult to argue, using just special relativity, what happens in that frame. But today I would like to show you a clever way to get some insights into the physics of the accelerated frame. So let us consider the following setup of the twin paradox. Let the first twin be completely still, so that his trajectory is just a vertical line, and let the traveling twin initially move with a constant velocity, but then let him make a sudden turn so that he keeps moving with a constant velocity but in the opposite direction. So the moving twin, apart from his turning point, is just another inertial observer. Let's call those observers Alice and Bob. So Alice is characterized by a single inertial frame of reference, and notice that the temporal axis of that frame is parallel to the trajectory of Alice. And that's a universal property of frames of reference. The same applies to Bob. So for the first segment of Bob's trajectory, denoted with the red color, we will introduce a primed inertial frame of reference that has a time axis that is parallel to the red part of the trajectory. And similarly, we can introduce the double primed frame of reference, and again, the temporal axis of that frame has to be parallel to the yellow segment of the trajectory. The next important observation is that the notion of simultaneity is different for each of those reference frames. For example, for Alice, two events are simultaneous if they lie on the common horizontal line, which means that this event will be simultaneous with that one, this one with this one, and so on and so forth. So what is special about that horizontal line is that it is parallel to the spatial axis X, and therefore we will introduce a plane of simultaneity on which any pair of events is simultaneous in a given frame of reference. And the plane of simultaneity has to be parallel to the spatial axis of that frame. So for the prime frame of reference, the corresponding planes of simultaneity have to be parallel to the X prime axis. And therefore for Bob, this event will be simultaneous with that one, this one, with this one, etc. And once again, we can introduce planes of simultaneity of the double primed observer by just repeating the same procedure. We simply have to introduce lines that are parallel to the X double primed axis. And this construction will allow us to notice something very interesting about the twin paradox. During the U-turn, where the rocket undergoes the rapid acceleration, the rate of the clock that Alice holds far away rapidly increases. Bob will notice that Alice's time speeds up. So we can see that something really interesting happens when you stop being inertial and start to accelerate. And we will learn about that uh, soon. But for now, all we want to say is that it's Bob's acceleration that introduces the asymmetry between both twins. Un I would like you now to imagine something. Suppose that we are living in a universe that has this weird property that if you go straight all the time, then eventually you will return to the starting point after making a huge loop. Now, this seems crazy, but it turns out that relativity does not exclude such a scenario from our own universe. But now we would have to face the true twin paradox. Because imagine now that there are two inertial observers, Alice and Bob. Alice is standing still and Bob is going straight with a constant speed, without acceleration, and eventually goes back and meets with Alice again. Then according to Alice, Bob, who was traveling all the time, had to undergo the time dilation. But according to Bob, it's the opposite. And Bob did not accelerate. There is only one solution to this crazy problem. Whenever you have space-time that has this property that when you go straight, you go back to the starting point, and you call those space-times once with periodic boundary conditions, there has to exist a preferred inertial frame of reference. We cannot have Galilean principle of relativity. Oui. But notice that whenever you hear about extra dimensions from some particle physicist, 
What they say is that there are these extra dimensions, they are curled up, which means exactly what we just explained, that if you go along that extra dimension, you'll eventually go back. And you'll go back very soon because these extra dimensions are apparently tiny, we don't see them. So after making a very short trip, you go back to the starting point. But that implies that along these extra dimensions, we cannot have principle of relativity. And this is something that is usually overlooked in the discussion of the extra dimensions. And I thought it's good to know these things. So in the last episode, I promised to show you that according to special relativity, Elvis still lives. And I guess this is the right time to show you and to prove you that I was dead serious about it. I wasn't kidding. Okay, so let's introduce another inertial frame of reference and suppose this is our frame and in that frame right now happens here. So the present plane of simultaneity crosses this single event. Now, let's suppose that Elvis dies here and we are standing in exactly the same spot only many years later. We will now show that there exists another inertial observer for which Elvis' death hasn't happened yet. Elvis is still alive. And that observer, right now, is very far away, somewhere here, and he moves away from us with a relativistic velocity. So that his plane of simultaneity is slightly tilted. But if we examine where that plane of simultaneity crosses our position, it turns out that it crosses it in our past. Which means that for that distant observer, the event at which Elvis dies hasn't happened yet. For that observer, Elvis is truly alive. And if that is still hard to believe, consider yet another observer that is far away, but moves towards us. Let's introduce his frame of reference, and you can see that from his perspective, according to his notion of simultaneity, our future has already come. For that observer, you have already finished listening to this video. And maybe you have died already, who knows? So the lesson we have to learn from here is not that the future or the past is relative. I would rather say that the notion of plane of simultaneity, or in other words, the notion of now, even one that is relative, is at best an approximation. <laughs> Let us go back to the definition of the proper time. And let us notice that the moving clock is not necessarily moving with a constant velocity. It can accelerate. But our clock clearly does not experience that acceleration. Because its rate only depends on the instantaneous velocity and not acceleration or higher derivatives of position. Is this okay? Is it really how normal clocks behave? Every single of these clocks, when moving with a constant speed, undergoes the exact same universal time dilation effect. And the reason for that universality is very simple. If I start to move with a constant speed against those clocks, then there should be no reason for any of these clocks to react differently than the others. And since my motion is only relative, it doesn't matter whether I am moving or the clock is moving in the opposite direction. But it's a whole different story when it comes to accelerations because it does make a difference whether I accelerate or the clock accelerates. These two situations are completely different. So my favorite type of clock is a pendulum clock, one that has been invented by Galileo. So here's the thing, if I accelerate that clock, then the pendulum will start to swing at a different frequency and the rate will get affected by the acceleration. Therefore, the pendulum clock is a terrible candidate for an ideal clock because it feels accelerations. So what about more precise clocks, like atomic clocks, for example? Okay, so an atomic clock is essentially a collection of atoms and a bunch of lasers sitting on an optical table. And if you accelerate this whole fancy device, all these lasers will just simply smash against the floor, and that will be the end of it. The clock will break in a spectacular fashion. 
So the question is, whether the truly ideal clocks can even exist in nature. To figure this out, let's consult some common wisdom. This is my favorite brick on relativity written by Landau and Lipschitz. And according to the urban legend, there is not a single word written by Landau in that book, and not a single thought contributed by Lipschitz. Jokes aside, they do introduce the formula for proper time. Unfortunately, they don't even discuss the problem that we are trying to solve here. This is another famous textbook on relativity written by James Hartle, and he does have to say a little bit more about our problem. After introducing the formula for proper time, he says the following. It should be emphasized that that formula holds even for accelerating clocks, i.e. when the velocity is dependent on time. And then he refers to a famous experiment that provides evidence for the correctness of the formula for the proper time. So let's discuss the experiment that was mentioned by James Hartle. So the problems with clocks arise from the fact that those clocks are complicated mechanisms. And those mechanisms have to eventually break down when subjected to high accelerations. So let's think about a simple clock, one that has no mechanism whatsoever. And there are such clocks. Namely, those clocks can be constructed out of a single elementary particle. For example, a muon. A muon is a particle that has no structure. It's a point-like object. There are no gears and wheels inside. Therefore, there is nothing to break. But how can we turn a muon into a clock? Well, muon has this interesting property that it always decays after a while. It decays into an electron and a bunch of neutrinos, and that happens after a characteristic time, some microseconds or whatever. So in principle, we could take a bunch of muons and count them after a while and estimate how much of them are left, and that will give us an estimate of how much time has passed. And now the question is, what happens to a muon if it accelerates? What happens to the decay rate? And the experiment that was mentioned measured exactly that. And it was experimentally verified that the decay time of a muon that undergoes huge accelerations up to 10 to 17 g, which is unimaginably huge, was not affected by acceleration whatsoever. So in principle, a decaying muon is a great candidate for an ideal clock. But it turns out that we still have missed one important detail. And now I would like to show you that the concept of an ideal clock turns out to be inconsistent with the basic laws of the quantum theory, which means that the ideal clocks simply cannot exist. Let us investigate a little bit more. So this is the textbook written by Wolfgang Rinder, who famously introduced the idea of an event horizon of a black hole, which we will discuss in the future. But in this book, he seems to be aware of the problem that we want to solve. So after introducing the formula, he says the following. If an ideal clock moves non-uniformly through an inertial frame, we shall assume that acceleration as such has no effect on the rate of the clock which means that its instantaneous rate depends only on its instantaneous speed v in accordance with the above rule. And this we shall call the clock hypothesis. So in 2015 I have co-authored a paper on this hypothesis and called that paper Ideal Clocks a Convenient Fiction. And this is a claim of the paper. No device built according to the rules of quantum field theory can measure proper time along its path. Highly accelerated quantum clocks experience the Unruh effect, which inevitably influences their time rate. This contradicts the concept of an ideal clock, whose rate should only depend on the instantaneous velocity. What difference does it make that we cannot measure that proper time? Who cares? Well, without being able to measure time in a universal way, time loses its operational meaning at all. So, in highly non-inertial frames of reference, there is no default way of measuring or even defining what time is. Mm -hmm. The paper caused a little drama and went viral. So let me tell you a little bit more about the Unruh effect and its consequences. So apparently Richard Feynman was really interested in this problem. We know that because when he died, 
He left a blackboard in his office, and on that blackboard he had a list of problems he wanted to learn. And among those, there was this Unruh effect. And I had a chance to discuss this with Bob Unruh himself. And I asked him what he thinks about Feynman wanting to learn about his effect and never having a chance. And Bob replied in his typical style, saying that, well, I once tried to explain that to Feynman, but clearly he did not understand. The effect is really very surprising. Imagine a completely empty space, as empty as possible, and we call a state like this a quantum vacuum. Now, it is known that if you move through quantum vacuum with a constant speed, the space around you is still empty. But if you accelerate it through that same vacuum, it turns out that the space around you would not be empty anymore. It would be full of particles. And the number of those particles is very tiny. Normally, you don't even see it. But as you crank up the acceleration, there is more and more of those particles. And eventually, that effect will start to dominate everything else. Also, those particles would have crazy properties that involve something that is called quantum entanglement. And this is also closely related to something that is known as the Hawking radiation of the black hole. Unfortunately, I don't have time to discuss all these things in detail right now, maybe later. So, from the perspective of a muon that is moving with acceleration through vacuum, the state around the muon is not empty. It's filled with particles. And those particles have an effect on the decay rate of the muon which can be proven, and that's what we have shown in our paper. Which means that if the acceleration of a muon is high enough, it will experience the acceleration that will affect its decay rate. So even muons are not ideal clocks. Uh, we are done for today. If you like the video, you know what to do, I'm sure. Also, if you want to expand your knowledge on relativity, just get my textbook on relativity. It's called Unusually Special Relativity. It's available on Amazon. The link is in the description. But right now, you have already plenty of stuff to digest. Happy contemplating, and I will see you in the next episode. Get out of here. Yeah.